The US Army was not in a position to be particularly proud of itself in terms of anti-tank capability at the beginning of World War II. However, Japan wasn't doing much better. For most of the war, the Japanese anti-tank gun was a 47mm, which was for 47mm standards actually a very good gun, but you're still talking only a 47 at times that you start going up against vehicles such as the M3 medium, the M4 medium. Japan went to certain lengths to make sure that enemy tanks were destroyed. They came up with the lunge mine, for example, which is basically a big shaped charge on the end of a long bamboo stick and you go up and you go, ha, and you jab it into the side of the tank and hopefully blow up the tank. Survival rates of the operator are not known, but are presumably low. Theoretically, another option for Japan was you dig a big hole, you put a, an artillery piece inside the hole, not a piece, I'm sorry, a shell, you would set the fuse, and you would make the hole big enough that in addition to the artillery piece, there was also an individual in there with a hammer, who when the enemy tank drove overhead, he would then hit the fuse with the hammer and blow up the tank. Now, that said, I haven't seen any evidence of that being used, but that was uh, the reputation. Where am I going with this? Well, when faced with a larger armored threat and also Japan deciding that let's make armored divisions where we probably want to have as much self-propelled track stuff as possible, they set about the challenge of creating tank destroyers, basically self-propelled vehicles with a high velocity cannon on tracks, preferably with a bit of armor. They came up with a couple of different variations. The first one that they said, hey, this actually works, was the Type 1 Ho Ni. Now, the US had this nasty habit of finding Japanese armored vehicles and blowing them up. Which means that finding a Japanese tank destroyer of any type is rather difficult. However, as you can see, we have found one. We are in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, this vehicle is in the possession of the US Army's Artillery Museum. And as ever, we're gonna have a little route around the vehicle and see what makes it tick. For their first foray into creating a self-propelled tank destroyer, the Japanese decided reasonably enough to start at the base of a known vehicle. In this case, the Type 97 medium tank, the Chiha. However, most of the time, what you will do is you will start with the base of a tank, let's say the powertrain and the suspension components, and then you will modify things a little bit differently. You will note, for example, that well, a lot of what was on a Sherman isn't on a Priest. They didn't bother doing that with this vehicle. They quite literally took a Type 97 tank hull, removed the turret, opened up the roof a little bit, and that was it. So that's why you still see the bulge around the driver's position, which is not present on some later vehicles. And where the bow machine gun would ordinarily go, they did a you know, basically like a firefly. They just removed the machine gun, they put additional armor plate on the front, and called it good. Otherwise, though, that the easy thing about this is because it is effectively a chi a hull, all the specifications and measurements that you can find online are for the chi ha. And I don't need to measure them, uh, which would be a problem because I don't have a metric measuring tape, and I would only give you things in eighths of an inch. Uh, but I might have to do that for the uh, armor plate anyway. However, all that aside, you will note the excellent vision provided by the little slits. Now, yes, there is a little visor here that can flip upwards, and so when the guy isn't getting shot at, he can actually see where he's going. I can tell you from having been inside vehicles with vision slits, that vision is terrible. They should probably be called blindness slits. Moving further forward, okay, nothing unusual, very common for a lot of tanks at the time. You'd have access hatches here for the transmission or steering systems. Come a bit further forward, you'll see bolts holding an access plate in position here. So if you did have to pull the transmission, you undo all the bolts, the entire lid comes off, move it off to the side, and then it can play with transmission and differentials. 
Similarly, you have rivets here with additional screws. Now, of course, the only reason to have screws is because you want to dismount something. And it seems to me, without being able to actually physically open these things up because they're frozen solid, that the transmissions are mounted, or correction, the, the final drives more accurately. So the, it'll go from the steering system to the brakes and final drives under here. Uh, they're mounted with the screws. You can then undo the screws and maybe pull things back to go up. Your guess is as good as mine. I have not seen one of these things open yet. I do plan on trying to fix that, but that is not gonna happen today or on this video. Moving further forward, I have to assume this is where your headlight would go. Uh, there's a couple little holes in, in here, it looks like, that perhaps the cabling will go into. Towing eye at the front, the final drives I mentioned, and you can see they've been given a little bit of additional armor. Curiously, the armor is curved inwards just a bit here, and I can't help but notice that the armor is interfacing with the track pin. Ah, and the reason is because the armor has shattered and it's come forward about a, about a centimeter, centimeter and a half. So ordinarily, they are not supposed to interface. They are, hooray, congratulations. Uh, but you can also see the final drives on this side because the armor has been shattered away entirely uh, with all the bolts that are used to hold the one in place with the other. So that's about it. I'll talk about the superstructure in a moment when we get to the side. We're not going to spend too much time on the suspension. It is a standard Type 97, which we will doubtless encounter many times over the course of filming. So I'm just going to quickly mention the sprocket, which is a little unusual because of these rivets we have here. Most sprocket wheels are bolted on into place. The idea being that as the sprockets wear down, all you do is you undo the bolts and you pull it off. In fact, there's a, there's a German vehicle right next to us and you can see the bolts holding the ring in place. It doesn't look like that was an option for the Japanese because the only bolts that we have here are located here in this big one in the middle. If you look on the inside, uh, these don't look like they're related for anything other than pulling off the entire sprocket unit as a whole. And this nut here seems to be a hub nut. Uh, I do note a fluid filler point here, so you can at least keep your sprocket lubricated while it hasn't worn out yet. Also, while I'm leaning against them, you'll see the track link, single pin, cast, dead track, basic as basic comes. A cotter pin is punched up from the bottom, it splits up into two, and it stops the pin from falling out. If you have to get the cotter pin out, you got a little hole at the back here, you can squeeze, push out, and the pin can then slide outwards. That's pretty much it for the sprocket. Now let's move back, because what I want to have a look at before the superstructure actually is this little hatch here on top of the driver's compartment. I don't think it's for a periscope. I wouldn't put a, mount a periscope that way. And I've never seen a Japanese tank with a periscope. But I don't see a point for it either because you're not gonna have signal flags or anything else like that. I'm sure somebody will tell us in the comments what it's for if I don't find out in a future video. For now, your mystery to ponder until the next video comes out. Right, superstructure. I had mentioned how what the Japanese did was basically just bolt a superstructure to the Type 97 hull. And when I say bolted, I literally mean they bolted it on. However, there is evidence on this superstructure of a very rare and almost mythical event. Japanese armor actually stopping a projectile, we think. Note the crack in the front armor here, which by the way, well, I'm here, might as well measure it, is about an inch, so it'll make it about 25 millimeters. There's an impact mark here. So as near as we can tell, what happened was the round came in, just kind of shaved the edge of the armor, cracked it, stopped. So around this small, we figure it has to be a 37 because anything bigger would have gone right through. There's a catch. If you look on the back side, you're going to see what appears to be a spall debris mark, that uh, a section about yay big, detached from the back plate of the armor, 
and flew somewhere inside, which may have been the cause of the crew abandoning the gun and the gun eventually being captured and then sent from where it was in Luzon, whatever circuitous route it took, to end up here in Oklahoma. The side armor is uh, the same thickness it looks like from the uh, visor gap as the front armor. Uh, and another interesting point actually caused by this, and which may account for the spalling, is that the Japanese metal might have been a harder type of steel, a more brittle steel, than most other countries were using, which may also account for some of the other shatterings and breakages that we see in the armor plate elsewhere on the vehicle, such as on the vinyl drives that we saw earlier, or even the back part of the armor here. You can see the armor has just completely split. And the, you know, good metal isn't supposed to do that, even after many, many years out exposed to the elements. You'll see some of the other vehicles that are in this collection, they spent many years outside in Aberdeen and they did not split and crack in the same manner as the Japanese ones. So a metallurgist can probably chime in, but I think this is an indication of a flaw in the design. That said, at least as far as it went, it did seem to stop the round. Now, a quick observation on the suspension. Yes, it's the same Tomiya Hara suspension that you see on a lot of other Japanese vehicles covered elsewhere. But a little comment for those that like to nitpick, or those who want to deal with people who are nitpicking, especially in model contests where somebody comes up and this is wrong because he this. Uh, on the whole row, we noticed that the mounting point for the coils were identically arranged forwards to backwards. So all four of the springs were, let's say, horizontal to the front, like on this one, and vertical to the back. However, on this vehicle, they are mirrored. So on the fronts, they're horizontal. On the backs, they're vertical. Now, I cannot see any mechanical difference that comes. It seems to me that it's just as effective either way around, just from the design and to the way that these things are mounted, that they're the same width and you can just plug one onto the other. And it seems to be dealer's choice which way they want to flip it over. But I just thought it was worth noting that, yeah, they are officially identical, the two chassis and two suspension types. But if you're actually putting one together with your little tweezers and your magnifying glass, don't be too upset if one is backwards and the other one isn't, because it looks like they did it both ways in real life. Actually, there was a, many moons ago, there was a uh, magazine called Model Railroader did a, a, there was a prototype for everything section that basically said, oh yeah, an airplane wouldn't really get this dirty or uh, lettering doesn't melt. Exactly for this reason, because in real life, all sorts of things happen. And especially under the exigencies of warfare, standardization sometimes goes by the wayside. I like all this artillery. So here we are in Fort Sill. It is the home of artillery. All artillery officers and soldiers go through Fort Sill as part of their training. And it looks like to have a lot of fun because this booming has been going on for as long as we've been here firing away, uh, perhaps they're just trying to get rid of all the ammunition before the next tornado hits and they have to shut down training. There's a downside to Fort Sill as well, apparently. So the back of the TD, well, again, Type 97, and everything has been welded in place for security, just to make sure that nothing bad happens to the vehicle. I can't help but notice that if somebody ever decided they wanted to restore this vehicle, they're going to have a heck of a lot of fun. A, because the metal is brittle, and B, because the bolts have shattered off. I do notice, though, I suspect this may be twinges of the original color underneath. Uh, this was repainted at Aberdeen in a sort of a tan and brown combo. It's not the original paint. Underneath, though, I'm not so sure. Looks like a taillight fixture down below here. Uh, I have no idea what you would be accessing in the back under here. It's the Mitsubishi Type 97 engine underneath. It was, I seem to recall, it was about 140 horsepower. 
that could be edited out or maybe they'll put a little subtitle if I get it wrong, we will see. Or I could just go to Google and look it up. Or you could go to Google and look it up. That happens too. And what I try to do is I try to show you things that you don't get from a Google search. You don't know what the, how, much, how many horsepower the Mitsubishi engine puts out. I'm sure it will tell you. It is a diesel. Uh, it is relatively unique. The Soviets used diesels, the Japanese used diesels. That was about it for most of the war. Uh, but again, that was a factor of the Japanese army being at the bottom end of the priority list for any resources that anybody wanted. And diesel was always left over and you can make it stretch a little bit further, even at the cost of uh, horsepower. Anyway, that little rant aside, the track tension is done in the apparently typical Type 97 manner of a screw ratchet. And just like the last time I looked at one of these things, the ratchet is currently up and the tension seems to be being held together by the rust. Nothing else to see on the back. Again, you got two towing eyes uh, to match with the one at the front. So you have the triangular frame and that is it. The tank would have come with two mufflers, one on each side, the pipe will come out, make a left, there'll be a wire mesh or a cage, and then the exhaust will go out the back. However, the mufflers came to grips with an unfortunate accident, and there's not really much left of them. On the plus side, you can actually have a rough look as to what the inside of a Japanese Type 97 muffler looks like, and then make your extrapolations from the wreckage. The other thing I'll note is that this vehicle does not have the armored steel protective housing uh, that is on some other vehicles. No explanation as to why. I'll also note that unlike some other vehicles, this has a semi-armored cover on top of the radiator. Uh, the Horo, you will recall, had a stowage point on top instead, a box. Speaking of boxes, the Sponson box is not a Sponson box on this particular vehicle. And on the whole row, you would have seen an actual Honest God stowage bin. Apparently they decided that later on, whatever is behind this armored housing didn't need to be there or be as protected. Make of that what you will. I cannot open up the engine deck for a couple of reasons. A, it's falling apart brittle metal, and B, it seems to have been welded in place again for everybody's safety. Right, the raison d'etre of the Type 1 is the Type 90 75mm gun. Now, it looks like the Japanese kind of changed their naming system at some point. It was called the Type 90 because it was the uh, 2590th year of the Japanese calendar. Whereas I believe later they changed to a system which depended on the year of the reign of that particular emperor. Regardless, the idea behind the gun, which was a perfectly serviceable field gun in towed configuration, was to hurl large pieces of metal at the enemy, as you might expect. Now, it is mounted on a limited traverse mount. You got about 10 degrees to each side, you got about 5 degrees worth of depression, and 25 in elevation. Although I do note that at maximum elevation, I don't think you can actually load a round of ammunition into it simply because the projectile or the correction, the entire round will interface with the engine deck when the gun is elevated. So hopefully you're not shooting anything up any hills. Uh, this vehicle was found on Luzon. There are a couple of hills in Luzon as I understand things. Uh, so it is a limitation. Traverse and elevation are simple hand cranks. You will note that there is no slot for a telescope. The sight was a periscopic sight. There's a little notch out here for the sight to come up so that you can actually see and engage in full protection of the one inch of armor to your front here. Actually, as I'm looking at it, it'll be two inches of armor because I'm seeing where this connects here and it looks like there's the main plate and then you have the main armor around it. So well, there you go. A lot more armor than I gave it credit for. So uh, two inches comes out to about 50 millimeters. 
more likely it was 50 millimeters, which comes out to about two inches in all fairness. But anyway, uh, rounds fired, obviously you got your armor piercing and high explosive. Supposedly there are 54 rounds stowed in this vehicle. Somewhere I can only assume most of those rounds are in the front left where the hull gunner ordinarily would have gone. Again, similar to Firefly, simply because this is actually a very confined area to be working with. Usually SPGs, they give the, the guys running around a little bit more space. And that is not the case in, the, in this particular context. I, I see there's a, an ammo bin on the floor here. I don't think that was where it originally goes. Uh, but regardless, you're trying to navigate around. I get it, World War II Japanese personnel were a teensy bit smaller than I am. But even at that, I mean, I can imagine just bashing your head on the traverse gear as you're reaching down, then you're still hunkered down trying to get the round back and then up. You're not looking at the best way to fire for this. On the commander side, it's basically just vision slots and one vision block. And that, that's basically it. I do note some electrical connectors on the wall. There's one here on, underneath me as well, possibly power. It could actually be that this vehicle had a radio. Uh, Japanese radios in World War II were not robust, but they were good quality. So when they worked, they worked very well. Uh, the problem was that they weren't really weatherproofed. Now, I'm not going to go down into the driver's position for three reasons. One, I'm not sure my tent and the shot is up to date. Two, I really am worried whether or not anything in here will hold my weight and I won't fall through the bottom. And thirdly, it's a bit of a wreck and I've seen a better one anyway. Have a look for the whole low video and you're going to get a slightly better view of the driver's controls. However, they do look absolutely identical, complete with the four handles for steering. So as near as I can tell, one is a clutch for a loose steer. And if you had to make a hard, a hard turn, you actually grab both on one side one is a clutch, one is a brake. And same for the other side. And then there's a central brake for both brakes. Uh, then you've got the gear shift and then this parking brake, it looks like it, it. Yeah, complicated. You need more legs than you probably have uh, and the arms. But uh, that said, so again, you can see the spalling, it looks like that came out here next to the vision block. Behind me, as I'm looking, I see what appears to be an air intake for the engine itself. And then next to it is what I am told is a fuel injector. So the injectors are actually not anywhere near the engine. I presume they ran out of room underneath the engine deck, uh, but there are metal pipes that go from uh, here, which I presume is the injector, as I say, 12 of them, one for each cylinder, going to the back. So my guess, fuel. Right, so that's your tour of the Honey. Overall, I can't say this is a very good vehicle. Now, I will say it's got a couple of things going for it. One, the Japanese could actually get the thing from A to B. So bear in mind, the Type 97 medium tank, medium, 15 ton is the same as an M3 light tank for US service. But Japan did not have the same infrastructure, didn't have the same port capacity. Oh, we, we need cranes. Well, let's just build a crane. We'll ship a crane across the Pacific, like the US could do. The other good thing about it was, well, it did make a good 75 millimeter gun, self-propelled and able to get to where it needed to be. It wasn't very effective once it got to the other end because of the limited traverse, because of the presumably low rate of fire, uh, but you could do it. So if this thing happened to find itself pointing at a Sherman, for example, the Sherman might actually die. On the other hand, Obviously, there is room for improvement. So they barely built two dozen of these things, the Honey 1, before they went to the Honey 2. They built almost three score of those, and that had a 105 million howitzer, so it was really more of a self-propelled gun, before moving to the Honey 3. Now, the Honey 3 was developed as, again, a tank destroyer with improvements determined from this original vehicle. So, for example, you will see that instead of the open casemate, it is a fully enclosed casemate structure to provide some protection for the poor blokes inside. Although, given what happened to the impact on this one, I'm not sure it would have made a heck of a lot of difference. Regardless, no Honies 2 or 3 are known to exist. So when it comes to Japanese tank destroyers, 
It's what's in box and it's what's here in Fort Sill. Right, I hope you found the tour interesting and informative. I'll talk to you on the next one. Geographic condition, the industrial condition, the personnel division. Division? Condition. <laughs>